Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're going to continue our uh, our series on uh, on aid for Ukrainian refugees that is provided out of out of Poland with a special guest, Jonathan Ornstein, Executive Director of the JCC Krakow. Thank you so much for sharing some of your experience with us. And you're coming from the city of Krakow and from your organization, right, through this wonderful technology that we have today. Absolutely. I'm here in Krakow. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our work here supporting Ukraine. And it's 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 so interesting what you are doing. Could you describe the scale of your organization and uh, the scale of a, of a JCC in Krakow? You know, Krakow had this vital Jewish community. Uh, before the Second World War, and much of Poland's Jewish population was destroyed during the Holocaust. Talk a little bit about the development of the JCC Krakow, and in, in particular, Jewry throughout uh, the nation of Poland, where, where so many people were just wiped out. Yeah, well, Poland was, uh, as you said, Poland was an overwhelmingly Jewish place before the war. Um, there were 3.1 million uh, or 3.5 million Jews living in Poland. About 10 percent of the population uh, was Jewish and 90 percent of the Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. And usually for us in the Jewish world, that's the end of the story. We understand there were survivors. We know they left Poland and went to the United States, to Palestine, which then became Israel, to South America, wherever they could go, anywhere in Europe. And we usually don't think about Poland in the Jewish context uh, beyond 1945, but not all the survivors left Poland. Some did stay. Um, and then during communism, during the 45 years of communism, there was anti-Semitism here once again. And the survivor, Jew, the Jews, the survivors who stayed uh, essentially went underground. Um, so there were really there was really no Jewish life uh, by the end of communism, not too much. And in the last 32 years now, something quite remarkable has been happening, which is young Poles are finding out that they actually have Jewish roots. Um, people finding out from their grandparents, finding photos of people with beards, finding finding letters or documents, going online at you know uh, ancestry.com and things like this. My wife herself, I met my wife who grew up without knowing she was Jewish and uh, came and found out and then came to the JCC after finding out that she was Jewish. So our center has been open for 14 years and we're dedicated to one, taking care of our Holocaust survivors. We have over 50 Holocaust survivors, Polish uh, survivors that stayed, that never left and we're taking care of them uh, and really looking toward the future of trying to rebuild Jewish life, trying to reach out to all of these young Poles, especially especially young people who have uh, recently and are just still finding out that they have some Jewish roots and to try to encourage them to connect to their heritage and welcome them back into the fold. And that isn't unusual in our history, right? During the Spanish Inquisition, we had Jews going underground and, and generations later finding out that they're Jewish. Uh, if you take a look at Madeleine Albright, finding out in, as an adult that she was Jewish or Cardinal Lustiga, Cardinal Lustiga, um, also called the Jewish Cardinal of the Catholic Church. Um, you know, the, a family friend of ours, Arnold Lustiga, his brother, he was the one who, uh, with his brother, found out that they that they both actually existed. Uh, he had been adopted by a Catholic family and was um, was about to take his vows when he discovered it. And the, the, um, the Catholic priest that was bringing him through that process said, hold on, do not take your vows think about it for a year before he did. And he he thought about it. He took his vows. He became uh, ultimately a cardinal. But he found out very late in life that he was Jewish. So this, this kind of a rediscovery of, of tradition um, and being able to evolve an organization like yours in support of the community was, is, is quite extraordinary. Before we get on to what you're doing with the refugees and the displaced, uh, could you talk a little bit about um, uh, the organization it's founding, the date of the date of the JCC's founding, and then uh, sort of give us a thirty foot uh, view of your operations there, and then we're going to talk a little bit about your philanthropic work on behalf of refugees. Sure. So we actually have an interesting uh, founding story. We were we were founded by Prince Charles, uh, the Prince of Wales, who visiting Krakow in two thousand two and met with some 
Holocaust survivors, and he was very moved by their histories, first surviving the Holocaust and then essentially outlasting communism. And he asked what they needed. And they said, we have all these synagogues. Krakow is home to a seven renovated pre-war synagogues. But they didn't. They said, we have a place to pray, but we don't have a place to be together like a senior citizen center. And Prince Charles uh, said he was going to help, uh, help them realize their dream. And he got involved with an organization in the UK called World Jewish Relief, which was the organizer of the kinder transport during World War II. And they took a look at Krakow and they realized that it wasn't on this, only this older population that the prince had connected with, that there were young people who beginning, as we've been talking about, to find out about their Jewish roots. So they went back to the prince with a counter proposal saying, we'd love to do this uh, project for the survivors, but let's do something even bigger like a JCC and help to flush out this community and, and develop the, this community and give it maybe uh, help give it a future. Uh, and uh, Prince Charles said, OK, gave some money. And, and then with his involvement, uh, they were able to open the JCC in 2008. Uh, he was in attendance, as was uh, uh, the Duchess of Cornwall, Camilla. Uh, so we've been open for uh, 14 years. Generally, our operation uh, is a small but growing operation. I think before this whole uh, before February 24th, before uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we were about 30 full time employees, um, another 20 or so part time. And then what's really interesting, 70 non-Jewish volunteers. So this idea of Jews and non-Jews working together is, uh, is a big part of our ethos here. Um, we are a community of firsts. We opened a, uh, a preschool, which is the first Jewish community preschool to open in Krakow since the Holocaust. Um, we have a Sunday school, BBYO and Hillel, youth organizations are being run through our JCC. I mentioned we're taking care of Holocaust survivors. We have Shabbat dinner every week. Um, we publish a newspaper. We have a choir. We have a genealogist. Uh, we have a few hundred people studying Hebrew. We have Arabic class. We have Yiddish class. Uh, so really, you know, if you look at it, it's a small but growing community and almost everything going on in our community is going is being run through our JCC. So where that includes direct financial aid to, uh, you know, to needy families, um, to Holocaust survivors. So we're wearing wearing a lot of hats. There's no federation here like we have in the U.S., the federation system or Jewish family services. We're we're uh, we're called a JCC, but I think we're really a JCC plus. And one of the things that I think is, is so very interesting is that your existence, the fact that you're doing what you're doing, the fact that you're making friends, the fact that you're providing services, it's, it's kind of an, you know, if you're going to survive, you have to make sure that the Nazis don't win, right? And, and existence is, is part of that. And then service is another part of it. And, and we have this other situation in which we have a neighboring country to Poland, again, being invaded. Um, in, in that particular case in the Second World War, it was Poland being invaded. How do people in Poland view this situation in Ukraine in the context of, of their history? Um, you're, you're probably best positioned to do this, given the fact that you're right in the center of this historic city and, and you're talking with people every day. How, how are, what is the perceptions there? And I'm sure that there's not just one, right? That there are multiple dialogues happening. So could you unpack that for us? I mean, I think in the first place, Poles are very mindful of where they are geographically in Europe. And Poland is in a very difficult place in Europe and really not where you want to be historically, which is between Germany and Russia. And they have very bad memories of Germany invading on September 1st and Soviet Union invading on September 17th. So while we as Jews are focused primarily on the Nazis, you know, other countries in this part of the world we're, we're really got it from both sides. And, and the Nazis might be worse than the Soviets, but not by much. So when this all happened, I think Poland, in some ways, you know, we were all surprised that Russia actually invaded, um, although forces were massed at the, at the Ukrainian border, you know, build, building up to the invasion. But Poles weren't surprised that Russia did this. Poles weren't surprised by Putin because this is Polish history is always having this aggressive aggressive Eastern neighbor uh, who either, you know, for, for over 100 years of Polish history had taken a part of Poland. You know, Poland, we should remember that Poland was partitioned and until World War I for 125 years was off the map. 
So this is, uh, you know, it, it's not surprising here. And Poles are wary of Putin and this government especially is very, has been for, for years uh, very anti-Putin. So I, I think that this is also informed the response to say, you know, that, that Poles are mindful that we could be next. What you're basically saying is that is that the Poles don't want to have an armed Russia um, on their border. That's what you're basically saying is that is that you know part of this response is basically saying um, the Russians have to be stopped as far away from our borders as possible because we're next. Absolutely. Russia so they yeah. told us that we're next, right? Yeah, no. They, you've heard you've heard different Russian officials in the last few weeks have you know have said it pretty openly that the next country that needs this, you know, denazification, as they call it, is Poland. Yeah, it's and and so also it, it also places within context the the support that you're receiving, right? If you take a look at Poles as being uh, different religions, right, uh, Catholic primarily. Um, and then this this nascent Jewish um, uh, community, the communities that have an experience that are against this type of invasion, whether from the German side or from the Russian side, uh, suddenly become very natural uh, uh, allies. So that might also be a vehicle toward healing. Do you see it as such? Yeah, I mean, I think the healing process in many ways has been going on for for a long time in this part of the world um, after certainly since communism ended um, in, in places where uh, in, in countries where which weren't under the Soviet sphere of influence to the west of here, I think the healing was able to, to start right away after World War II. Um, but in places like Poland, the healing wasn't able to go on and countries, you know, in, inside the, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, because it wasn't in the Soviet Union's interest for any real discussion about what happened during World War II and any discussion of who was victimized was, you know, beyond just the fascists were, were you know, victimizing everybody. So we, we were a little, our, the healing process here is a younger healing process than it is in places like West Germany, which was forced to deal 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 with things right right uh, right after the war but but yeah for 32 years uh, there there has been healing going on in a, in Poland which is a very catholic country um a lot of the healing has been um helped and facilitated by the work that John Paul II did here uh being the pope being such a towering figure in Poland you know he's the he's like the mandela of you know of, of, of Poland in the world that he's seen there years right and and he always yeah. held this this center place um, yes people people talk about his activism but in many respects um he was the mandela who who did not uh, attack as 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 uh, as he might have instead he tried to uh create a healing balm across very very deep wounds yeah, no, and the Catholic Church, you know, the relations with the Catholic Church uh, are very warm, not even good, but, uh, you know, beyond just cordial and, and very warm. And, uh, and, and we, we understand that in Poland, and this is a strange thing to say, because, you know, throughout, throughout Jewish history, the Catholic Church has really not been a friend and has been in many ways the motor of anti-Semitism for, for, for a couple of thousand years. But we really have a partner in what we're doing here in, in Poland and whether that's helping to um, fight against anti-Semitism or supporting these, uh, you know, people seeking their Jewish roots, the Catholic Church. And this is directly because of the work of John Paul II uh, is, is a partner, a strong partner here. And so let's let's turn a little bit to helping um, other largely Catholics um, coming in as refugees, but also people of of different races who are who were in Ukraine and have been uh, replaced people from Africa um, you have also a, a very important program to help people who would be rejected by uh, mainstream uh, Polish society from the LGBTQ plus uh, community could you talk a little bit about the the range of of support that you provide for those who are displaced it's a very familiar a very familiar experience in Jews who were um, who found themselves refugees, you know, in in waves. So now you are having come back. You are now helping others who are refugees who are not necessarily Jewish. Talk a little bit about what you're doing and your and 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 how you're doing. 
when when the war started, we made a couple uh, decisions which have guided us uh, for these past three months. The first one is that we were going to do all we could as an institution, not do what was comfortable, but to fully focus and do all we could. Um, and in, you know, to that end, we've doubled our organization in size. So we had uh, we've, we've hired, I think, 25 full time people to focus on Ukraine. And we've we've actually doubled the size of the institution. So one was to do. From, from what date to what date did you double in size? Uh, within a month or so. You so over, we added. Yes, doubled in, within a month. Um, uh, that was the first decision. And the second one was that we were going to help Jews and non-Jews equally. So this was a, not only help Jews and non-Jews, not to build a mechanism to help Jews and then also help some non-Jews along the way, but to fully focus on helping everybody we could. And the, and, and you mentioned the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community uh, and, and non-white communities uh, who people, we also understood that the people were in more, you know, it, it, it had um, more need than we were going to focus on them more and make sure that the people that were, were not being helped by others would be would be supported. We also have a program to help the Roma community, uh, which left you, which uh, refugees left Ukraine, who are who uh, you know are just disadvantaged wherever they are. So for us, this was uh, this was the bit we understood. We we mindful of the fact that we, uh, as we've been talking about, were a community that was decimated during the Holocaust and essentially decimated because most of the world stood silent when we were being victimized. So we are the community in Krakow, which is an hour's drive from Auschwitz. And as the community uh, down the road from Auschwitz, I hope we uh, certainly, I, I hope that we, if, if, if no one else has learned the lesson of the Holocaust, and of course many have, then I hope the community down the road from Auschwitz certainly has learned the lesson and internalized this, that we cannot be silent when others are being victimized. And that's been our mantra since February 24th, to absolutely do everything we can to serve serve all the Ukrainians that we can. And you can make common cause with people who believe that it is not the ritual, it's not the specifics of belief, but it is the human family that requires support and service, right? It's the washing of the feet, right? In, in which you are um, expressing your own idea of service simply by serving. Right. And, and, and that's where you can come together. That's where the where the Catholic Church and um, and Jewish synagogues and, and Jewish communities can come together and just say, these are people in need. Let us help. And, and it comes out of the heart of each of the traditions and both traditions uh, equally if we if we turn our minds in that way. So you, you doubled your organization. Could you just deconstruct some of the programs that you provide? There are there are all sorts of different services that you provide, and let's also then talk about how you're funded because that's an also uh, an important part. You can't double an organization unless you have the resources to do it. No question. So we uh, the first thing we set up was a food uh, distribution point, foods, clothing, sanitary items, hygienic supplies, toys, even uh, pet food. Uh, that we, we people started to bring us donations, then we started to buy things and we started to raise more money. And we, our center is open seven days a week. We have about 600 uh, Ukrainian, it's almost all women and children who are coming into our building every day and taking for free whatever they need. Um, we, uh, that, so f- food is, is, is one large need. Uh, we saw in the beginning how that's changed. In the beginning, they would, somebody forgot a toothbrush or it was cold in February, they needed a sweater. Um, but now we see that it's primarily about food. So people are hungry and people people uh, need food. So that's become really the biggest part of what we're distributing here is every day, twice a day, we have food shipments that come in that we're buying and, and people are taking up to five, five 600 uh, people a day are coming in to take that. Um, but the largest, the largest and the most pressing need for us is housing. Um, there are about 150,000 refugees in Krakow in a city of 750,000, and the city itself is able to house about 10,000, right? So about six to seven percent are being housed by the city, and the rest by individuals who've been amazing uh, and NGOs like us. So on any given night, we have about 400 people that we're housing in hotel rooms. We have about 150 hotel rooms that we uh, that we that we are paying for, uh, and as long as uh, as well as a few other apartments and one large facility outside of town that has about 85 people to 100 people uh, Ukrainians every night. Uh, so housing is big. Uh, housing and food are the two biggest 
uh, needs. Uh, after that, it's psychological support. Um, these people have gone through absolute, uh, you know, the absolute hell, many of them in Ukraine, especially ones that saw fighting that, uh, and, uh, you know, victims of sexual violence, people that are all separated from their families. It's a particularly vulnerable population because it's it's only women and children primarily. So that's been a big focus for us. Um, we've set up a safe space for women and children, daycare, psychological support, as I've mentioned, legal, uh, legal counseling to help people with immigration and other issues that they have. Um, just, uh, I think, 15 or 16 separate programs that we're working both on our own and with partners to be able to to be able to do what we can and to help these uh, help these Ukrainians. And, and this is uh, something that, that we all need to appreciate. Poland's population has exploded by a little bit less than 10 percent overnight, right. but it's concentrated in the major cities. So Warsaw, right. um, Krakow, uh, some of the other cities are seeing increases in population of 20 percent. You you just cited a statistic, right? There's 750,000 yeah. people in, in uh, greater Krakow and you have 150,000 refugees. That's 20 percent population increase. Right. Where do you put all and then how do you feed them? And then how do you ensure that we don't have the uh, blowback of negativity that can come from having refugees in your space for a long time? If I'm if I open my home in my heart after a certain period of time, three months, six months, it becomes very, very wearing and my resources are limited um, and my perhaps my philanthropic feelings. Um, uh, shift. Are, what are you seeing in that respect? We're starting to see that. Um, so people here, you know, we should be mindful. We're talking about a city. People have apartments or small houses. We're not talking about, you know, lavish estates that people can host many people. We have a community member uh, who's a single mom who has a three bedroom house and she was um, hosting 23 Ukrainians at the, at the, at the high point. So this is something that's uh, this, this is the situation that we see. But yes, you're right. There are limited resources. People are not very wealthy here in Poland. It's not an, it's not an exceptionally poor country, but it's not a rich Western country, Canada, the US, the UK. We're, we're not in that category. So it's, it's difficult. And, and people are starting uh, to feel that. And, and, you know, and, and we're, we're mindful of the fact that the needs are growing, although there aren't that many new Ukrainians coming in. Um, the numbers are stabilized or even a little bit going in the other direction. But the people that are here are in greater need and have been here for months and, uh, and, and, and do not want to move to the West. These, these are women and children who want to be united with their, with their families and they want to go back to Ukraine. And we just need to keep them housed and fed and give them the support that we can. And uh, you asked about funding. We've been uh, this is all our all of our efforts are being funded um, by donations. Um, mostly in the United States, but also in the UK and, and around the world. We've received um, over 3,000 individual donations to our, 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 our organization in the US. We have a US-based Friends of organization, friendsofjccrackout.org is the website. And we've set up a, a link there where people can make tax-deductible donations. We've raised almost $4 million uh, for what we're doing and need to raise probably two and a half to three million more. And that's going directly to uh, to people in need. So a as you as you look at this this uh, situation, um, how do you see it developing, and what is the view in in Poland about the patience of an autocrat versus the uh, ability to sustain consensus of a, of democracies? Do you think that Putin has made a good bet in that he he can be more patient and outweigh uh, outweigh uh, democracies like Poland? You think that there will be a, a shift that will uh, require of the Ukrainians a compromise simply because the Ukrainians are so reliant on the West for, for treasure, for the ability to continue the struggle. Um, how do you see it? Uh, I think that's what that's what common common knowledge would tell us, but I don't think that's what we're seeing here, especially that we saw the EU now to vote to severely limit uh, the import of Russian oil. Uh, which is the major source of income for for Russia, of course, and really keeping the Russian war machine going. Um, so no, I don't think we're I don't think we're seeing that. I think the timing of it, uh, you know, we, we the winter will be the scary port for us. So I think that if it starts to get to October, November, December, then that's where we're really we're really in trouble. You know, it seems like war with Russia, as we saw 
80 years ago is very dependent on timing. Um, and, and this part of the world gets very, very cold and, and the needs, fuel needs, things like that, electricity needs go up uh, and, and, and that will affect, that will certainly affect things. But no, I think that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing the, the European Union uh, united in a way that it never has been. Poland being connected and feeling part of Europe in a way that this government has trying, really been pushing it in the other direction. And we now see uh, that everybody in Europe including previously neutral countries, uh, suddenly, you know, everybody understands the value of, of, uh, of, un of, the, of the European Union, of NATO, and, and of being together. And in this case, so far, the dictator is, is not dictating the terms. And, and I think that the world will continue to stay united. I think in Poland, we don't feel, we don't feel that anything is fraying. So the rational strategy of, of Putin would be to create uh, as much refugee pressure as possible to last throughout the summer, wait until it gets cold, where the pressure on Europe and on Poland will be higher, drive more refugees toward the West, create higher, higher resentment. So in a sense, the battlefield strategy is, is really uh, almost a human emotion strategy. Of, of course. Uh, of trying to to uh, to deal with that. So right. when you he's not doing that, you know, but it's interesting because there are things that he could do. It would be very easy to send a few missiles into the center of Odessa, which would then, you know, the, or, or other cities that have been haven't been that affected, which would which would then precipitate a, a refugee crisis from those cities. So, you know, we anything we think of, they've already thought of, but yet they're not doing that. And I guess though they feel there's a feeling that the West can still increase their sanctions so that the whatever whatever sort of well i also think that that putin would have uh, a real difficult time um uh, being viewed as destroying uh slavic um culture uh which um which odessa kind of encompasses there's this this place that odessa has and so he's okay destroying a place like mariupol but not necessarily a place of, of Slavic cultural significance. I think that's also one of the things that protected, uh, funnily enough, Krakow to, uh, I'm sorry, Kiev, uh, Kiev for, to, to a uh, certain extent, um, because uh, Kiev also has this, this, uh, th this connection. Uh, let, me, let me just get back to this whole idea of resource flowing uh, from overseas, because we're coming to the end of our, of our time. When resources come to you, uh, to what extent does that go directly to refugee families, for example, or to, to certain designated purposes? Or are you just basically receiving your resources in a, in a chunk and you're just doing your best to supply needs on a day-to-day -day basis? How, how, how does that work? Uh, it depends. We're, we receive some targeted funding. So people say they want a specific for specific programs to to pay for psychologists, to buy food, for housing. You know, we receive in some, and then in some, in some we also just receive money that we're able to uh, we're able to use to uh, you know as we as we see fit. Um, so in both, and we're also we also provide, but in a limited way, direct financial support to the Ukrainians, cash cash support. But mo for the most part, most of the money that most our largest costs are housing and then food by far. Well, if, if we look at the world as becoming more fractured along political lines, along lines of value and so on, and we look at this as part of the fracturing of the world, what do you see the role of your organization in a, in, in a larger sense about, about trying to heal that, heal those fractures. Do you see yourself as uh, an organization that is dedicated to healing, advancing particular Jewish culture or knowledge of particular Jewish culture? Is it, is it about refugees? What is your central purpose that gets articulated in, in these various ways? Or do you have one? Uh, I think that this are uh, the central purpose of our organization is to provide hope and for that hope to manifest itself in, in terms of support. So if, you, if we think about a community that's been decimated the way that ours has and yet does not closed off to others and is still growing and is Jews and non-Jews working together to rebuild Jewish life down the road from Auschwitz, then I think there's a, there's a powerful message there that no community is ever, can ever be written off. 
that this community, you know, had, would have every reason to to you know to not to not trust the other and to not to not uh, work well with 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 non Jews. Yet that's very much who we are. And I think that uh, you know the uh, the way that the community, the Jewish community next to Auschwitz behaves. Um, has resonance beyond uh, beyond where we are here, and I think especially you know at a time of increased anti-Semitism in the world, the idea of our community doing well and thriving, I think, reminds um, those who would do us harm. It reminds them of the strength and resilience of the Jewish spirit, but I think more importantly, it reminds us. Uh, we grow up in a world where we take anti-Semitism as a given. And uh, the fact that our community is not defined by anti-Semitism, we say that we're not, we here are not Jewish because of Auschwitz, we're Jewish despite Auschwitz, that what defines us is not what was done to us, but what defines us is our response. And our response is to rebuild. And now during this new crisis with Ukraine, our response is to do the exact opposite of what happened 80 years ago when the world was silent. So we stand up unified as one voice and support support these these victims today. May the seed of hope that is being planted by you and your organization at uh, JCC Krakow sprout into a beautiful flowering um, uh, of, of, of culture, of, of community, of, of peace, and of a strong civil society. Uh, stay strong in that effort, uh, you have our admiration, support, Jonathan Ornstein, Executive Director of JCC Krakow. Thank you so much for sharing the work that you're doing. It is so incredibly valuable to us, and we will uh, try to continue to galvanize support for your organization and your efforts, which are your, which are our efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Stay safe. Be well.